A short summary of why he does that, by Lundy Bancroft by the Inner Revolution, saving you time on your journey to wisdom. Subscribe to our channel for more free audiobook summaries now. Lundy Bancroft's Why Does He Do That? explains the motivation and logic behind domestic abuse so that victims can better defend themselves against it. Bancroft draws on his decades of experience as a counselor, custody evaluator, and child abuse investigator to explain how abusers think. He argues that abusers treat their partners badly because they benefit from doing so. The most common explanations offered for why abuse happens, that abusers don't understand what they're doing, can't control their emotions, or act out of unresolved trauma or substance abuse problems, deflect responsibility from the abuser in a way that's ultimately unhelpful in getting him to change. The problem is not that an abuser doesn't realize he's doing harm but that he doesn't value his victim's happiness or safety, and he feels comfortable using violence, intimidation, and emotional manipulation to get his way. Therefore, attempts to fight abuse must focus on bringing consequences to bear for abusive behavior, pressuring abusers to take responsibility for their actions and the harm they do, enabling victims to leave the relationship or demand changed behavior, and ultimately changing how society talks about abuse and the rights of disenfranchised groups. Bancroft was heavily involved in the founding of Emerge in 1977, the first organization in the U.S. to focus on working with abusers to combat abuse through education and counseling, rather than by helping victims to escape or pursue a legal case. Many similar groups have been created since the book's publication, though they're still the minority among anti-abuse organizations. This guide organizes Bancroft's many checklists and anecdotal examples into the following core topics, defining abuse, with examples, and consideration of popular myths around why abuse happens, understanding how abusers think by unpacking abusers' self-justification and selfishness, and learning how to fight abuse both on an individual level through anti-abuse programs and on a societal level. We'll explore each of these points while supplementing Bancroft's arguments with the writings of other anti-abuse advocates and updated statistics. Bancroft's intended audience throughout the book, Bancroft uses he pronouns for abusers and she pronouns for victims. He argues that these pronouns best represent the vast majority of abusive dynamics and that misogyny plays an important role in allowing many abusive men to get away with their behavior. At the same time, he acknowledges that abuse can occur in same-sex relationships and that women can abuse men, and he insists that his advice still applies in those situations. For clarity, this guide will follow Bancroft's pronouns. Bancroft provides statistics demonstrating that women are disproportionately the victims of abuse and men disproportionately the perpetrators, but since the book was published in 2002, these statistics are out of date. However, more recent studies show the same trends. One in three women worldwide are or have been victims of domestic abuse, compared to one in four men, and women are injured or raped by partners at much higher rates. Men are more likely to be murdered than women but women are more likely to be killed by a partner. While not every person who behaves badly in a relationship is an abuser, Bancroft advises that anyone who feels chronically mistreated, controlled, or silenced by her partner, or feels that it's not safe for her to leave, should consider his advice. For readers who do feel that they may be in an abusive relationship, Bancroft provides a list of books, websites, and hotlines designed to help abuse victims in different circumstances. Defining abuse. Bancroft defines abuse as controlling, angry, and violent behavior committed by a man against his partner. He defines abusers as men who have an ongoing pattern of mistreating their partner either verbally, physically, sexually, or with a combination of the three. Verbal abuse involves insults, threats, and raising your voice, physical abuse involves physical violence and destroying objects, and sexual abuse involves any unwanted sexual contact or language. While nobody knows exactly what causes people to be abusive, Bancroft stresses that abuse is deliberate, that is, it's a behavior that the abuser does on purpose because it benefits him. By mistreating his partner, the abuser gains more power over her, making it easier for him to vent his negative emotions and force her to perform whatever physical, emotional, or sexual services he demands. Dehumanization versus abuse. 
By emphasizing abusers' choices and awareness of the harm, the harm that they do, Bancroft is arguing against the perception of abuse as something purely irrational and impossible to control. On the contrary, abuse makes perfect sense from the abuser's perspective because he values his own convenience over the well-being of his partner. Psychologist Paul Bloom echoes Bancroft in his argument that extreme violence against a vulnerable person or group up to and including genocide doesn't stem from an inability to recognize others' humanity, but a willingness to harm other people to achieve certain goals. Insults, beatings, assaults, and murder are used to enforce social hierarchies that benefit the perpetrators at the expense of the victims. For example, in the wake of desegregation in the 1960s, Racist agitators would harass and attack black students not because they saw the students as less than human, but in an attempt to force them away from the schools they had a legal right to attend. Myths about abuse According to Bancroft, talking about abuse is made more difficult by the fact that not many people who work with abusers and their victims recognize that being abusive is a choice. Certain myths about abuse, that abusers are simply crazy, that abuse is caused by addiction, that abuse is a problem specific to a particular class or community, and so on, not only fail to protect victims, but actually help abusers by providing covers for their behavior. In recent years, mental health experts have pushed back against using the word crazy to describe perpetrators of violence, be they abusive men, mass shooters, or political leaders. Critics argue that calling these people crazy obscures the fact that most know full well the consequences of their actions and undertake them purposefully either. Because they enjoy hurting others or expect to benefit from doing so. In addition, using crazy as a derogatory term is harmful to non-violent mentally ill people, unfairly associating them with crime or abuse. Bancroft disputes these myths by stressing the intentionality behind abusive behavior and the need for abusers to take responsibility for their actions. Myth number one, most abusers are mentally ill. According to Bancroft, the vast majority of abusers do not have any serious psychiatric illnesses. Mentally ill people are statistically far more likely to be victims of abuse than perpetrators of it, and being a victim of abuse can actually cause post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, and exacerbate existing disorders. In addition, abusers will often use the fact that their victim is struggling with mental illness against her, accusing her of being delusional or pointing to her emotional turmoil and stress after years of mistreatment as evidence of unfitness in custody battles. The majority of modern domestic violence and mental health organizations agree with Bancroft that most abusers are not mentally ill, and that mental illness in itself is rarely the cause of abusive or violent behavior. In contrast, victims of abuse are three times more likely than the general population to show symptoms of PTSD, to develop a major depressive or anxiety disorder, or to self-harm. They are also four times more likely to attempt suicide and six times as likely to struggle with addiction. Myth number two, most abusers are themselves victims of abuse. Abusive men will sometimes claim to have been abused by their mother or an ex-girlfriend as an explanation for their problems with women or mistreatment of their current partner. According to Bancroft, these claims are usually fabricated. Of those who did grow up in an abusive household, it was usually with an abusive man whose behavior they learned to model. Claiming to be a victim allows an abuser to avoid ta taking responsibility for his behavior, and accusing an ex allows him to distance his new partner from any past victims who might try to warn her about him. In addition to claiming to have been a victim of abuse in the past, abusers may also claim that their current partner is the one abusing them, or that they mutually abuse each other and so neither one can reasonably claim to be the victim. This idea of mutual abuse is largely dismissed by domestic violence advocates as ignoring the power dynamics at play in the relationship and demonizing the victim's attempts to defend herself. If a couple regularly devolves into screaming arguments, but one partner always starts and ultimately wins them, that is not mutual abuse, but the continued exertion of his power. Myth number three, abuse is caused by addiction. Most abusers are not addicts, and being an addict does not cause someone to become abusive. Bancroft acknowledges that some abusers have their worst outbursts while intoxicated, but no one is only abusive when intoxicated, 
and people bear full responsibility for actions they take while under the influence. In addition, treating addiction rarely stops abuse. The abuser might be happier, healthier, and more emotionally stable, but so long as he still feels entitled to hurt his partner to get what he wants, he will continue to do so. Because drugs and alcohol can lower inhibitions and impair judgment, substance abuse is sometimes associated with violent behavior. However, lowered inhibitions alone don't account for the ways in which an abuser continually manipulates and intimidates his partner even when he's sober. Intoxication may make specific incidents worse, but it's not the primary cause. In addition, people struggling with addic addiction are more likely than the general population to be victims of domestic abuse, not just perpetrators. Myth number four, abuse is a problem specific to a certain class, race, or religion. Bancroft dismisses claims that abuse is more common or inherent in a particular race or religion as being racist and reductive. Abuse occurs in any society with unequal power dynamics between groups of people. This mainly occurs in patriarchal and sexist societies that devalue women and allow men to exert total control over their partners. In addition, abusers are all more alike in their behavior than different. Bancroft claims that in his work as a counselor he saw men from different backgrounds use the same abusive tactics and justifications. While some abusers might prefer verbal abuse and others more often resort to physical violence, their ultimate goal is the same, the total domination of their partner for their own gratification. Journalist Jess Hill expands on Bancroft's point in See What You Made Me Do, demonstrating through extensive interviews with both abusers and victims that abusive men all tend to follow the same script of controlling or violent behavior. In addition, Hill argues that domestic abuse looks remarkably similar to the brainwashing and torture tactics used in POW camps, or by anyone who trades in captivity, kidnappers, hostage takers, pimps, or cult leaders. Framed this way, abuse is best understood not as being hyperspecific to a partic particular couple, their environment, or even their cultural background, but rather as a manifestation of the same tactics of terror, oppression, and coercion used across the world. Recognizing abusive behavior. Having defined abuse as deliberate mistreatment, Bancroft spends much of the book providing specific examples of what abuse looks like in practice. While abuse is often divided into categories based on the tactics used, verbal versus physical versus sexual, Bancroft argues that most abusers use all of these tactics to different degrees and at different times, depending on what they feel most comfortable with or what gets the best results. Bancroft instead breaks his examples up by their intent, manipulation or intimidation. While some anti-abuse advocates still distinguish between emotional versus physical abuse, many others, like Bancroft, point out that different tactics have the same. Abusive motives and that emotional and physical abuse generally go hand in hand. In addition, studies have shown that emotional abuse can be just as damaging as physical abuse, even if it doesn't leave visible marks. Manipulation. Manipulation, mainly involving verbal and emotional abuse, persuades the victim to doubt her own thoughts, feelings, and opinions in favor of accepting whatever the abuser wants her to believe or do. An abuser uses manipulation to make the victim more emotionally dependent on and willing to cede control of the relationship to him. Some common manipulative tactics Bancroft describes include constant bullying and insults, which break down the victim's self-esteem love bombing her with time and attention early in the relationship and then abruptly withdrawing it, and shutting down any attempts at argument. Manipulation can also include gaslighting, in which the abuser attempts to convince his victim that she's crazy or can't trust her own judgment by repeatedly lying to her and misrepresenting past events. He'll accuse her of imagining things or making them up to upset him, and he'll generally trivialize her perception as being less accurate or trustworthy than his own. When gaslighting succeeds, the victim becomes dependent on the abuser to tell her not just what to do, but what to think. Intimidation. Intimidation, mainly involving verbal and physical abuse, forces the victim to comply with the abuser's demands through actual or threatened violence. Abusers use intimidation to terrorize the victim into obeying them and keeping silent about the abuse. 
Some common intimidation tactics Bancroft describes include physical violence, threatening to hurt the victim or her loved ones, and falsely accusing the victim of infidelity. An abuser may also demand to know where the victim is at all times so he has constant access to her, or he may sabotage her finances to make her increasingly dependent on him. Accusations of infidelity and excessive jealousy in general are a common factor in abusive relationships. While these behaviors may come from genuine feelings of insecurity, anti-abuse advocates warn that jealousy is often just a convenient pretext for an abuser to demand more control over his victim, such as forbidding her from speaking to friends, insisting that she come home early and update him as to her location at all times, excusing his violent outbursts as being expressions of his intense love and fear of losing her, and so on. Rather than relying on one approach or the other, abusers will regularly switch between them. Bancroft suggests that this constant switching is itself a tactic of control, by playing hot and cold, the abuser keeps his victim constantly on edge as to which version of her partner she'll come home to. The intimidation feels more frightening for being sudden, while the manipulation feels like a relaxing of tension and thus a relief. This hot and cold behavior is sometimes referred to as intermittent reinforcement. The term was coined by psychologist B. F. Skinner to describe a system in which rewards are delivered at irregular or random intervals as a means of maintaining control. If someone believes that they'll eventually be rewarded for a certain behavior, such as, in the case of an abusive relationship, total submissiveness and capitulation to the abuser's demands, they'll continue to engage in that behavior, even if the effort they're putting in far outweighs the actual reward. How abusers think. Having defined what abuse looks like from the outside, Bancroft moves on to his main goal of examining the logic behind abusive thinking. Because abusive behavior is a choice, Bancroft calls it a problem of morality, abusers feel comfortable engaging in hurtful and immoral behavior for their own benefit. The three main characteristics of abusers are their intentionality, their selfishness, and their feelings of self-justification. We'll discuss each of these characteristics in detail. Abusers behave intentionally. Abusive behavior can seem senseless or random to the victim, who is unable to predict the abuser's moods or what might set him off from day to day. According to Bancroft, this is a tactic abusers employ deliberately. The more time a victim has to spend thinking about what the abuser might do, the more control he has over her life. The unpredictability of an abuser's behavior may lead a victim to become hypervigilant, constantly on the lookout for subtle changes in the abuser's mood so that she can try to appease him and avoid a violent outburst. Not only does this rarely work, but it also places the victim in a permanent and exhausting state of anxiety, a survival mode that sees any potential conflict as a threat. As a result, many victims become people-pleasers in their future relationships. Having been conditioned to suppress their own needs and to fear even minor disagreement, victims may struggle to honestly communicate what they feel to a non-abusive partner. However, on the abuser's side, his behavior has a clear goal and logic behind it. This is not to say that all abusers are criminal masterminds who plan their emotional outbursts in advance, but when an abuser has an outburst, he does so knowing that it will get him what he wants, the victim's capitulation. We can see this intentionality in three aspects of the abuser's behavior. He never goes too far, based on his definition of the phrase. When Bancroft asked his clients why they didn't do something worse when they were supposedly out of control, why, for example, an abusive husband merely beating her, the almost universal response was that they would never go that far. Demonstrates that even during periods when an abuser seems crazed, he is behaving only in ways that he deems acceptable or justified. What he considers acceptable varies from person to person, and even over time, some abusers do ultimately kill their partner, but whatever that line is, he will not cross it, no matter how enraged or intoxicated he is. That abusers are in control of their actions is further demonstrated by the fact that the most extreme acts of violence committed in an abusive relationship up to and including murder generally occur after the victim tries to leave. An abuser doesn't kill his victim out of uncontrolled, irrational rage so much as in a last-ditch attempt to control and punish her. He's rarely abusive in front of others. 
An abuser can turn off his abusive persona and turn on the charm when there's a risk that someone might witness his abuse and bring consequences to bear. A number of victims recount that as soon as the police showed up, their abuser became calm and articulate, downplaying what happened or depicting her as hysterical. An abuser will also often wait until they're behind closed doors to turn on a partner, even if what upset him occurred hours or weeks earlier. Many victims remain trapped in abusive relationships because their abuser is so good at switching between personas that no one believes such a likable man could be abusive. Charm without feeling. This ability to quickly switch between personas is sometimes discussed in psychiatry as a trait of sociopathy or personality disorders. When a person lacks empathy or is unable to form strong emotional attachments to others, it's easy for them to treat people with extreme charm or extreme cruelty. Their behavior isn't motivated by genuine feeling, but by a desire to win a social interaction and get what they want, and they feel little to no guilt for the emotional impact their behavior has on others. While most abusers aren't full sociopaths, they do tend to lack empathy for their victims. This absence of feeling similarly enables both the abuse and the abuser's ability to manipulate others into seeing only what he wants them to see a charming, trustworthy, and non-violent man. He rarely does anything to hurt or inconvenience himself. Abusers might smash or break items seemingly at random when in a rage, but as Bancroft points out, these are usually items belonging to the victim, not to him or shared by both of them. He will be violent or cause property damage in ways that hurt his victim, but he won't inconvenience himself by, for example, damaging his own car, striking items that might bruise or cut his hands, or breaking things that he bought for himself. On the rare occasion that an abuser does hurt himself or his property, there may still be a self-serving and outwardly abusive motivation behind it. For example, an abuser who struggles with addic addiction may deliberately relapse or threaten suicide in order to convince the victim that she'd be endangering his life by leaving him or that he needs her in order to get better even if he ultimately never does. Bancroft argues that the rationality behind abusive behavior becomes especially clear in abuser intervention programs or in counseling, where abusers feel comfortable discussing their behavior. According to Bancroft, very few of his clients struggled to come up with a reason for why they behaved abusively. On the contrary, they almost instantly and with no emotional turmoil clarified how a specific outburst allowed them to get revenge on a victim or to force her to give them something they wanted. Bancroft's impression of his clients is reflected by the rare public confessions made by abusers, who were fully aware of the harm that they were doing but found ways to justify it to themselves or to repress their guilt. Abusers are self-centered. Bancroft argues that because abusers are rational actors and fully in control of their behavior, their decision to be abusive demonstrates a deep selfishness and lack of empathy. An abuser is indifferent to or actively contemptuous of his partner's happiness and safety, approaching their relationship not as a meeting of equals or a site of compromise, but rather as a power struggle that he intends to win. He believes that his feelings, opinions, and desires should always be put first and that his partner's role is to satisfy him. An abuser's selfishness motivates not just his bad behavior, but the honeymoon period which typically follows a violent outburst. After a particularly bad incident, the abuser will become loving, attentive, and apologetic, showering the victim with gifts or taking on responsibilities he normally leaves to her. He may promise to change, or attempt to gloss over the incident entirely. Rather than being motivated by actual remorse, these periods work to keep the victim hooked on their relationship, if she believes he's trying to get better, she's less likely to leave or involve the police. This selfishness manifests in three types of controlling and self-serving behavior. He's unwilling to admit wrongdoing or to be disagreed with. Arguments with an abuser generally only occur on his terms. He reserves the right to start or shut down any conversation at any time by walking away, making threats, or verbally and emotionally overwhelming his partner. Even in more relaxed conversations, abusers believe that they are always right and will become frustrated or angry at disagreement or their partner's attempts to assert her own point of view, especially if this disagreement has an audience. All couples argue at times, but in an abusive relationship, Disagreements are sudden, explosive and one-sided. 
In psychologist Michael B. Rosenberg's Nonviolent Communication, he writes that for an argument to be productive, you need to recognize your conversational partner's humanity and try to empathize with their point of view rather than focusing on your feelings of anger or frustration. Because an abuser doesn't view his victim as an equal, arguments are less a form of communication than an opportunity to dominate her. He expects his partner to drop everything to please him. When the abuser needs something, that need is a top priority, but he rarely thinks of the victim's well-being in turn. If he's upset, the victim is expected to coddle him and attempt to improve his mood, or at least to be a passive outlet for aggression. However, if she expresses needs for emotional support, for sex, for him to participate more in chores, and so on she's accused of being suffocating, demanding, or selfish. An abuser will often project, or accuse his victim of the same harmful behaviors he himself engages in, being possessive or overly critical, spending irresponsibly, drinking in excess, or even being physically abusive. For abusers, this works to draw attention away from their bad behavior, put the victim on the defensive, and confuse bystanders, who may be hearing about these incidents secondhand and thus be unsure of whom to sympathize with. He regards himself as the final authority. According to Bancroft, many of his clients felt that, as a father or husband, they were the head of the household and had the right to make serious decisions on behalf of their partner or the family. Abusive men will often offload the work of actually caring for their children onto the mother, but then refuse to consider her opinion on issues like where they go to school. When it comes to money, he might berate his, his partner for mundane expenses and attempt to wrest control of it away, keeping her in the dark about what their financial situation even is. The After Effects of Abusive Parenting In adult children of emotionally immature parents, Clinical psychologist Lindsay C. Gibson warns that this simultaneously neglectful and controlling behavior can impact the child of an abuser well into adulthood. Because their father's affection is conditional and easily withdrawn, they may scramble to please him and suppress their own needs and desires to avoid upsetting him the same way that their mother does. The roles of parent and child reverse, with the child becoming a caretaker to their father rather than being able to rely on him for support. As an adult, they may allow their father to continue to exert undue control over their lives, dictating what they study, where they work, how they spend their money, and so on. Some rush into romantic relationships early as an escape, or to get the love they aren't getting from the abuser only to replicate the same unhealthy dynamics they're used to. This might mean seeking out abusive men or becoming controlling and emotionally volatile themselves. Abusers see their behavior as justified. Far from feeling conflicted or guilty about their abuse, many abusers see their behavior as justified and even necessary for the relationship to function. Bancroft notes that while many of his clients fully understood that they were causing harm, they rationalized their behavior, saying things like, I'm not like one of those men who would hit a woman for no reason. In the abuser's mind, the victim actually causes the abuse by stepping out of line or upsetting him. He expects his partner to behave according to his rules, and whatever controlling or retaliatory action he takes is either ne necessary to control her or not that bad compared to truly meaningless cruelty. According to Bancroft, it's this self-justification that makes abusers get worse over time, as increasingly violent and aggressive behavior will become acceptable to them if it allows them to maintain control over the relationship. Sometimes, an abuser will attempt to convince his partner to accept these same justifications, telling her that she deserves the abuse, and if she could just be better he wouldn't act this way. This is obviously a lie, used to deflect responsibility and break down her self-esteem. No one deserves to be abused, and in fact, most abusers repeat the same behaviors over and over with new partners. Abusers aren't reacting to the needs of their relationship, but repeating the same self-serving patterns of controlling or violent behavior. How to fight abuse Bancroft's explanations for abusive thinking help account for why abuse is hard to prevent. Most abusers don't want to stop being abusive. Stopping means losing all the benefits that he gains from being abusive, and for him to truly change, he must take responsibility for the harm he's done and resolve to treat others with more empathy and understanding. This means coping with feelings of guilt and potentially accepting the loss of a relationship, marriage, 
or contact with his children. Because changing is such a difficult and initially unrewarding process, with many abusers being unable to grasp how treating their partners better might be healthier for their own emotional fulfillment in the long run, abuser programs often fail outright. Bancroft admits that many of his clients made no attempt to change, backslid as the work became increasingly difficult or they failed to convince their victims to take them back, or feigned changed behavior just long enough to finish the program, at which point they resumed being abusive. Ultimately, abuser programs are similar to addiction programs in that they can only help a person who wants to be help helped. No one can force an abuser to change, and Bancroft warns readers that it's often better and safer for them to leave an abusive partner than to wait around in the hope of the relationship improving. Do abuser programs work? The efficacy of abuser programs has been questioned since their inception, since multiple studies support Bancroft's statement that few participants in abuser programs ever change their behavior. The Duluth model, which provides the basis for most abuser programs, aims to teach abusers about feminism and patriarchy so that they'll treat their female partners with more respect. This model has been critiqued for neglecting issues like race, class, mental health, and addiction, but there are few proposed alternatives. While some advocates conclude that only harsh punishments like jail time can deter abuse, others believe that counseling should rely more on exercises and activities, such as requiring participants to demonstrate changed behavior rather than merely attending the therapy group each week. Despite these difficulties, Bancroft believes that abuser programs can be enormously helpful in combating abuse, less for fixing all abusers than for the education and services they offer to victims. He therefore argues that for an abuser program to be successful, it must put the vict victim and her needs first, hold the abuser accountable, and address the cultural attitudes underlying abuse. Put the victim first. Bancroft considers his work as a counselor to have been primarily for the benefit of victims, even as he had more day-to-day -day contact with abusers. The ultimate goal of anti-abuse programs is to stop the abuse from happening, and if changing the abuser is impossible, Bancroft considers it the duty of counselors and legal authorities to provide the victim with everything she needs to safely exit the relationship and heal. To that end, Bancroft encourages anyone working with an abuser to establish and maintain contact with the victim throughout the treatment process. This will ensure, first, that the abuser's treatment is guided to some extent by the victim's needs and that he can't misrepresent what happened in the relationship. Second, it will allow the counselor to direct the victim to additional services, such as domestic violence shelters, mental health organizations.